could say this guy is the best fighter in the world. And 6,000 people came to watch him. On the other side, 100,000. 100. It's, it's a big difference. And when Tyson Fury fights Klitschko, believe me, they're going to have 200,000 people this year over there buying tickets. I, I, I believe that fight's selling out too. And they just said Billy Joe Sanders is going to be on the undercard of that fight. I mean, it's a... It's really sad where we're at. This is why I'm, I always ask that one of these guys have to fail. And I believe it's going to be Al Heyman because he's the new dog on the block. They, the old guys, they're not, they don't want to deal with this BS. They don't want to deal with these egos. You look at boxing is not about, oh, I'm a professional fighter, so I should make $3 million a fight because I'm risking my life. That that don't work. We, nobody cares that you're risking your life. That's not what boxing is about. Boxing is about the entertainment of two guys going in the ring, putting their lives on the line, and fighting. That's why we buy this sport. That's why we watch. That's why guys that make regular hourly paying jobs support your million-dollar paycheck to watch you fight. And it's getting old. All the talk about, oh, I, I fight, and because you don't, you shouldn't be able to, to criticize what I'm doing in the ring. It, at a certain point, you're going to start even losing us, and I think boxing has. Everybody knows the UFC, they could put anything on pay-per-view and get a million buys right now. Bob Arum talked about it this week. So we already know that in America, we are losing fan bases. One of these guys have to fall, and I'm, I'm sorry. I believe boxing is about... There's only a 1% that makes the top dollars. Everyone else, you're searching for that dream. You're hoping for that big fight. But don't, don't sit here and tell me because you've been undefeated for eight years, you deserve to make $15 million like Floyd now. I got a zero. It, it, it doesn't work like that. That's not how this sport is, uh, it was, was built. Yeah, what you said. It, it's true. No, Lee, it's... Uh, it's it's very sad where the sport. Look at HBO is dropping fighters every day now. Bob Aaron's talking about pulling his uh, his whole stable off of HBO. HBO is telling the the public, the media, they don't want to put any more money into the sport. Everyone wants to go to Al Heyman because he's overpaying. But then you got people like Daniel Jacobs complaining that he's not a star. Do you think possibly if you were on a big network with HBO, a big time um, um, mover in the entertainment business, that you'd be a little bigger? Like, are you guys shitting me? You actually think L. Heyman is bigger push or power move than HBO? Come on. How much coffee, Andrew? Five. I had five cups this morning, Lee. All right, so I'll insert right here. Uh, Friday night, knockout night at the D, for those of you who watched it on CBS Sports Nation Internet Underground Boxing, uh, which sadly had two of the best commentators. The two best commentators in boxing are doing Internet boxing. I mean, how sad it is, is it that uh, you know Jim Ross, who is a great play-by-play -play guy, along with Al Bernstein... Are doing knockout night at the D. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Yes, that's Al Al Bernstein, I think, has been mailing in for a few years though. I, I think Al, um, you know, he's getting paid. He sits in the back now and, and lets all the other guys do the talking. I that's just that's just my opinion on Al Bernstein. Now, I, I actually I get mad that he doesn't put more of his knowledge into the commentating anymore. I wish he would tell Ronaldo and fucking Paulie Malignaggi to shut up sometimes because. They're, they're really useless when it comes to calling the fight. Al Bernstein is the man. He's always been the man at Showtime, and they should let him uh, hold the reins a lot more than they do. So you guys can go check it out. Go to CBS Sports, whatever it is, on the Internet and rewatch it. I'm sure it'll make – it's on their, it's on their uh, televised network. But um, their main event was uh, Chris Van Heerden. Uh, taking on Steve the Dragon Claggett. Both of these guys were WBAO, IBFO, QRST ranked fighters. Sound, uh, sounds like a blood sport matchup. I just watched Chris. It, it Well, that's the way they build it. Chris uh, Van Heerden won the fight. Uh, he won by a 12-round decision, 10-round uh, decision nice. in what I deemed as possibly the dullest fight I have witnessed in quite some time. <laughs> the... And I have watched some really bad fights. But the co-main event was the big deal because that's where they sold all their tickets, apparently. So I'm going to give a quick explanation to boxing fans in general. There are 
two ways that promoters work. Uh, format number one is the PBC format, which is put lots of fighters with semi-notable names on with semi-noticeable uh, notable names and just kind of barf out a card in a major metro, make the prices fairly reasonable, and you should sell about 10,000 tickets. That's the usual norm for a fight. That's that's uh, Chocolito Gonzalez. Uh, Chocolate Gonzalez, if he had had a better stacked card, I think would have gotten a better crowd. The problem was the, the tickets were too overpriced, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the format for Knockout Night at the D, I can't stress this enough. For 15 or 20 bucks, you can sit within about 20 or 30 rows of the ring, right? Dirt cheap. It's in the backyard of the D. It's getting cooler in Vegas at night, so you're in downtown. It's a great venue. Um, I can't say enough. Roy Jones' format is to get a couple of the local fighters that are red hot. Like, they are the most popular guy that's kind of on the way up. And in the co-main event, which is what stole the show, um, a guy by the name of Nico... Where is this kid? Nico... I'm looking at the results right now. Nico Macias, living in Palm Desert. Okay, for those of you who don't know, that's Palm Springs. Took on Limbreth Ponce Jr., who was training out of Austin, Texas, originally from Mexico, now residing in Illinois, okay? Who was just basically a slab for Nico, who they're building up, who's now 12-0 and with four KOs. So Nico, literally everybody in this building or actually parking a lot, was there to see Nico. Here's the shocking part. Once Nico wins, here's the problem when you make Nico sell all the tickets. The place was empty. I don't know how it came across on TV, but I'm telling you, half of that crowd got up and left after Nico got his uh, eight-round decision. What time was the fight uh, over, Lee? Uh, oh, about 11. Ah, I had 10, 30, 11. I mean, they went live at 8.30 on television, right? So they let in at 6.30. I got there at 7, watched girls beat each other up and one other undercard fight. I don't know how I feel about women fighting at that level, like when they're starting out. Like, And I'm spoiled because I've watched Karina Moreno fight. I've watched real you know, WBC women-ranked fighters who fight better than the men half the time because they use good mechanics. Uh, but women who are starting out in boxing, it's kind of awful to watch. And if they're not attractive, it just makes it worse in my opinion. Like, I don't like watching two dudes who are chicks beat each other up, especially short ones. You gotta, I, I, I got a new rule. You can't fight unless you're taller than the ring ropes. Huh. Is that wrong? Yeah, just a little. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Roy Jones Jr., another great night. They've got another one coming up September 30th. Uh, I was there, enjoyed it. Roy Jones it, needs to put these things on a Friday night. You should not have a ballroom fight. It was a Friday fight. It was Friday. Oh, it was Friday night. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where I was. I was there. Um, if you want to go check out uh, clips or photos from the event, go check us out on Facebook, Fight Net Radio, or check out my Twitter feed. Uh, either one will get you to where you need to go on that. And that's my whole, Hey, I bought a ticket for it. I, I went at the last minute. I asked for a favor. Uh, they had three whole media members taking up the one media member table. So, <laughs> and they all brought dates. That's bad, right? Yes. When like, yes how many, that's terrible. How many credentials do, you need? do you need like six? Yeah. <laughs> uh, want to sit ringside? Hey, that was you back in the day. Huh? Can I have like, can I have seven credentials, please? You have no idea. Like, how did I have an entourage? Back in the day? For those of you wondering, yeah, you can Google my name and you can see why I had an entourage. <laughs> and I didn't have an entourage. I just had a bunch of people who were designed to keep me out of trouble. They tried. Yes, sir. That's all it was. That was a team of people that were designed to keep me out of trouble as much as possible. Now I'm, you know, I'm laid back. I got a 12 year old. I don't, I don't, uh, takes us to Saturday, more boxing. All right. We're out of Friday. Let's move into Saturday for God's sakes. Got a lot left to talk about. Let's start off at uh, 5:30, which was 2:30 Pacific time. If you listen to me, you follow my tweets. You would have known that at noon, I put it out there to bet the KO and won't go. Andrew, 
who successfully taught people how to parlay this fight so that they could get better than even money on the fight. Was it really? Uh, yeah, no, I have it on Twitter on my timeline. I said, take the unders. Well, I know. I just didn't know the under and, and Triple G by knockout would put you under even. It seems like... It would get you really close to even. It depends on where you went. I went around. There were only a couple of places in Vegas that would let me uh, place that bet, but... The WBC, WBA, IBF, and now, uh, what is he now? He's now the, he's also got another one, right? Does this give him yet another title no, for God's sake? No, 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 this, this was just a defense. This was a defense. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, um, he fought a welterweight. Yeah. Hey, the guy did. Golovkin fights Kel Brooks, who was a welterweight who came up to middleweight. I think that, if, and here's a big shout out to, uh, oh, why can't I think of his name? Uh bad on my part there was a great article written on twitter by one of the former co-hosts is it bad when i talk about co-hosts and i can't remember their name Matt uh, gabe gabe montoya gabriel uh a guest you know he was a he was actually on quite consistently for a while there in the sevens or eights on the radio but gabriel montoya uh gabe wrote a piece you can look him up online you can find him on my timeline um uh, he wrote a piece about the courage it took for and it did by the way kel brooks came up from welterweight literally to take this fight and basically got his shit handed to him right yeah, i mean that, that's the bottom line here uh, uh, a smaller littler guy which would be like canelo coming up to fight a freight train who is triple g the only person going into this fight, in my humble opinion, that believed that Kell Brooks was going to win this fight was Kell Brooks. So the WBC, WBA, IBF middleweight champion Gennady Golovkin retains his title in a TKO in the fifth round over IBF welterweight champion Kell Brooks on Saturday night at the O2 Arena. Uh, Golovkin share, uh, staggered Brooks in round number one, uh, but Brooks rallied uh, late in the round. Brooks landed some clean shots in two. Uh, it went on. It kind of dragged out. Triple G launched a furious attack in round five. His corner finally saw enough and threw in the trown. It was Gennady Golovkin's 23rd consecutive knockout fight. Uh, there you go. I mean, and there you go. Look it. Before Golovkin rolls on. He started he started coming on in that fifth. He started getting in the zone, Lee. You could see the, the robot was turning on, the punching machine, whatever you want to call it. Cal Brooks. I think you know what I think it is now that I've watched it? I think he gauges how much he can take from that fighter. I think that's really what sets him up. I think he's another one in the sick crowd. And when I say that, it's not a bad thing. It happens in the UFC, it happens in boxing. Um, I fall prey to it when, it, when I spar you like, I don't know how you were when you, when you were in the gloves, but there are guys who like to get hit before they turn their shit on. Right. And, and I mean, without even going into He's our definitely own examples, one of those guys that likes a couple of wake up shots. Triple G has always been that way. That's what he calls yeah. the drama show. That's why it's, yeah. it's funny how everyone hit up the internet right away saying he looked like an ordinary fighter that last night. Look, People, Cal Brooks showed up for three minutes of this fight. Okay, the first round, he's wobbled bad. He's hurt. He's holding. He's running, boxing, whatever you want to call, surviving. Second round dropped. Third round puts on a masterful performance. That third round, Cal Brooks showed how special he is at a welterweight, as a welterweight. Not a middleweight, but damn, was he good in that third round. Fourth round beat, fifth round quits. Look, and the rumor is, Cal Brook told his corner, I want out of this fight at the end of the fourth. His corner made them him go back out and then threw in the towel to put the pressure on them. There was 100,000 people at this arena. At least 60,000 of them were screaming for Cal Brook. Let me tell you, Amir Khan, you are a nobody when it's compared to Cal Brook from this point on. If I was Amir Khan... I would get into the ring with Cal Brook as fast as I can to try to make one more paycheck out there and then call it quits because Cal Brook is going to knock you out. He does have the bigger fan base, so the politics aren't even on your side over there. Um, Cal Brook's legit. 
You know, before the fight, I asked Kell Brooks to come in.